Welcome one and all from wherever you might be joining us, hopefully in your own lounge room today, sitting on your lounge enjoying uh, what has been prepared so far, a time of worshipping together, communion together, and now a time of coming around the word together. You know, here's the thing. We are socially distant, we all know that, but I love that in some ways we can still be joined together. And here is one of the ways. Me at this end of the lens, you at that end of the TV or the screen that you're watching it on, all gathering together around God's Word. I just want to uh, give you some feedback because lots of people have been asking me, hey, is it weird uh, preaching to a camera? And uh, I've been thinking about it. And in, in the very beginning... It was a bit weird, but I've been reminded that when I was 16, I had this incredible God encounter at a youth camp. Uh, It was in that moment that I would say is the defining moment where I knew that this was going to be a part of my future. So since then, I've been in what I call a perpetual state of preparation meaning I'm always preparing something. I'm always preparing a message that one day may be preached or may never be preached. But as a part of that preparation, I'm constantly preaching to empty spaces. In fact, I would say confidently that I've preached more to an empty room than I have preached to a full room. So it's kind of nice to have this camera here in front of me uh, and a few people, one in the sound desk and my favourite person of all, my beautiful bride. She is allowed to be here to encourage me as I preach. In fact, why don't you run up here real quick? She's the only non-camera operating, sound operating person in the room and she's here to encourage me as I yes. preach. So she, will you just give me some big amens today? I will. I can do that. Awesome. Fantastic. Love you so much. Well, we are going to continue in this. And, and here's a thought, it, just to go on with what I mentioned before. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. This is my revelation on being able to speak to a camera and not to people in front of me. And that's this. 1 Peter 4, verse 11. It's my scripture when it comes to anything to do with communicating God's word. It says, do you have the gift of speaking? Well, I'll let you decide whether or not that's true for me. I've taken on that as a revelation. Right, if I do, then he goes on to say, speak as though God himself was speaking through you. So here's my commitment to you. I'll speak as though God himself is speaking through me. My request is that you would lean in as if God himself was speaking to you. If I approach this like God's speaking through me, and you approach this like God's speaking to you, well, then I know that somewhere in there we're going to meet or God's going to meet with us and he's going to change our lives. And that's what we are all about. Today, we go into week five of our series titled The Final Word. And this morning, I've titled this message, Turning Restrictions into Redirections. This message is titled, Turning Restrictions into Redirections. Matthew chapter 4, verse 35, our key scripture for this entire series. We've been going over it week by week. It says, Jesus declared, The earth and sky will wear out and fade away before one word I speak loses its power or fails to accomplish its purpose. Over the Easter weekend, uh, we took some time to focus on some of Jesus' last words to us from the cross. Today, we're going to take the next step and look at, at some of his last words. In fact, his very last words, according to the book of Matthew, while he was on this earth. Making his last words a part of those that are his final words for the church moving forward. You can read them in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Jesus says to his followers, I have been given all authority under heaven and earth, therefore go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And be sure of this, uh, uh, sorry, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even 
to the end of the age. You know, in Jesus' final words, or in Jesus' last words, he chose to give the mission to the church going forward. His final word to us is our future declaration of what we've been called to do and who we've been called to be. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15, it condenses it, simply says, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. I love it from that perspective. Now, it makes sense for us as a church to be constantly refocusing around our mission. However, in our current season of isolation, this conversation about taking the good news to everyone everywhere, it hasn't lost any of its necessity to the church. In fact, I would say it's become even more of a significance to the church. However, The obvious question that is raised in this time of social distancing and isolation is how do we go into all the world with the good news when we are physically restricted to our own homes? It's a great question, and it's the one that I intend to answer today. So let's get our thoughts around uh, around what a restriction is. A restriction is this. It is the barrier to something moving. A restriction is the barrier to something moving. Uh, Around the time of the bushfires earlier this year, uh, it was a weekend that I'd planned to head out to Moree, uh, or or a time whenever it was, midweek, I can't remember, but I was heading out to Moree around that time. And I like to go the Grafton Way often. For those who are not familiar with where we are in New South Wales, Grafton is north of where I'm bringing this word from. And so I'm heading north and then driving west. So I get in the car and, and got a couple of my kids and we start heading out to Moree and, and I get to Grafton and there's a sign that says, you know, the road's going to be blocked. And so I drive up and it ends up being 30 k's out of town and I run into this barrier and there's a couple of blokes there and they say, sorry, mate, you, you can't go through. There is another option. You can go around this way. And so I start driving that way. Now, I want to let you know, I did look on my maps app, which told me these roads were open. Obviously, they weren't. So I go the second option, and I start driving that way. This one's 50 k's down the road. Again, another barrier. Sorry, you can't go through this way. Well, on that day, I had to drive all the way back south past my own house that I'd left about two and a half hours earlier and take the southern route to get out to Moree. Needless to say, because of those barriers... It became the longest trip that I ever taken to get to Moree. But I do want to add to my Moree friends, it was worth it and I would do it again just to see you all. What is a barrier? A barrier is something that gets in the way of whatever it is we are aiming to do. It is a restriction to what we have set out to achieve. In 1886, so before I go there, let me say... We've all experienced this. We've all experienced restrictions in our life. We've all experienced barriers. Some of you, when I say that right now, you can think of certain areas in your life where you just almost feel claustrophobic. I'll get that word right. Claustrophobic. You feel boxed in. You feel caged. You feel restricted, unable to move freely, unable to pursue the mission that God's put in your heart. And so we've all felt that at certain times. Well, I want to talk to you today about turning our restrictions into redirections. In 1886, see, what what we're going to do first is we're going to change the way we view a restriction. In 1886, a man named Walter George, you probably have never heard of him, he beat the standing world record for what had become uh, the race that measured man's greatest athletic ability. It was a foot race over one mile. See, now, these days, uh, we're enamoured by the 100-metre sprint. Usain Bolt and the rest of his crew uh, bursting down that straight 100 metres. We love that. But back in the day, I'm talking over a century ago, it was the mile, the magic mile. That was the distance, 1.61 kilometres of running for those who aren't aware of those distances. Well, Walter George... In 1886, he ran it in four minutes and 12 seconds. And when he did that, people started to wonder, could there ever be a day when someone ran the mile in less than four minutes? 
It, it became one of those things that it, it just went right out there as the vision and the goal for just about any runner who competed in that distance running. And everyone attempted and everyone fell agonizingly short. It was like it, was like it became this challenge or this barrier that the closer you got to it, the bigger the barrier became, the bigger the restriction became. I'm reminded of, a, uh, of driving out to Uluru with a couple of mates last year. And, you know, it, it, it was 3,000 kilometres of driving to get there. So as we, you know, were nearing it, we were looking with so much expectation to see this rock. And finally it came into view. And the moment we could see it in the distance, it already looked huge. But I tell you what, the closer we got to this thing, and this is obvious, right? The closer we got, the bigger it became until we literally parked our vehicle and stood at the base and looked up. And I can tell you, the size of this rock was daunting to just behold. And that's what this restriction or this barrier had become for all of these runners. The closer someone, it always looked big, but the closer they got to it, it just seemed like no one is ever going to be able to break through and overcome this barrier. Until the 16th, sorry, the 6th of May, 1954, 68 years after Walter George set that four minutes, 12 second time, Roger Bannister burst through the finish line of a, of a, of a mile race at the time of 3 minutes 59.4 seconds, the first man in recorded history to break through the four-minute mile barrier. You know, the feat was incredible. It took 68 years from the time people started really going for it till the time that it was broken, and that's an incredible feat. But here's what I want to draw your attention to today. After Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile, it was only 46 days later that an Aussie bloke, mind you, John Landy, he broke the record and did the race in 3 minutes 58 seconds. And it was within that year that another three blokes broke the record in the same race. In fact, over the next 50 years, a thousand runners would burst through under the time in the four-minute mile. You know, that's the thing about barriers. They are until they aren't anymore. It's like before the record was broken, a lid was on everyone's attempt. The moment someone burst through, the moment someone broke out, the moment someone went through that barrier, it was like the intimidation that surrounded that, that time frame. It was no longer there. It was gone. And now a belief, a conscious belief came into everyone's thinking. No longer was it just a great restriction. It had now become an achievable possibility. What was once a great intimidation had now become something that was conquerable and everyone knew it. Friends, we've just celebrated Easter, the time when we recognise the breaking through of the ultimate barrier. Acts chapter 2, verse 24, Peter is preaching to the crowd of people after, uh, after Jesus has ascended to heaven and he's telling them about God and he says, but God released him from the horrors of death. He's speaking about Jesus. God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life for death could not keep him in its grip. Come on, if you're watching online this morning, why don't you hit that big amen button if you're ever going to... If you're ever going to comment on the online platform, now's the time. Amen. Death could not hold him in its grip. What a powerful word. I absolutely love that thought. Would you, would you allow the imagery to just sit in your mind for a moment? It, it paints this picture of, of death being represented by a hand and the hand is, is gripped around the lifeless, completely restricted body of Christ. 
completely restrained, completely all barriers that could ever be imagined, wrapped up in that moment, held in the grip of death. And you can see it. And then there's just like this glimmer of light starts to appear between the gaps, between the fingers. It's just like God's doing, God's going to work. God's doing something here. And, and the, you just see the fingers of death start to peel back, start to, start to pry open as God just starts to flex his muscles just a little bit as Jesus starts to flex just a little bit. I feel like I'm flexing in God's Word just a little bit this morning. The hand of death is being peeled back. All of a sudden, the, the, the palm, it's completely exposed. It's, it's trying to restrain. It's trying to hold. But the power of the one standing firm, Jesus Christ, is pushing back the powers of death. And He is standing, flexing His life muscles, not just for Himself, but for us too, the ultimate barrier breaker. Jesus Christ is His name forever unrestricted. He is good. He is for you. He is the one that is turning all of our restrictions into redirections. What a picture. You know, before Jesus, it did seem like death would have the last word. But now we know this. Jesus doesn't just have the final word over death. Jesus is The final word over death. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. Death is swallowed up in victory, completely consumed by it. So we find ourselves here in a season that we've never experienced before. It's one that is defined by restrictions and barriers that we've never known before. So right now, If we see our restrictions or the restrictions, uh, if we see them as barriers to the good news about who Christ is and what he has done, if we see them as barriers to that going forward, we might respond by sitting back and saying, well, we'll get back to it when when we're able to do what we've always done again. But friends, if we are willing to look at every season, including this season, as being with out restriction to the gospel advancing, then we change our mindset. And instead of waiting for things to go back to what they were, we start looking for ways for the gospel to go forward as they never have before. Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says this, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. That picture of death releasing its grip, that isn't just a picture that we look to for Jesus. That's a picture that we're supposed to take on for our life as well. The same power that raised Jesus from the grip of death is, has released you too. So the best way to respond to our restrictions is to ask this question. Is God still able to do what he declared he would do? Jeremiah 27, verse 27, I am the Lord, the God of all the peoples of the world. Is anything too hard for me? That's what God said. Hey, it's a rhetorical question. Is anything too hard for me, God's saying? We're asking the question, God, can you still do what you declared that you would do? God's saying, well, you tell me, is there anything too hard for me? I love Job's response. He says in 42, verse 2, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. Now, friends, this season that we're in right now, this isn't the first time in history where the church has been faced with a scenario that wasn't working in its favour in regard to the mission going forward. Acts chapter 8 starts like this. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers, except the apostles, were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Here is the beginning of the adversary that the first century church experienced. This is the beginning of it. And we know that there was many more, but this is the start of it. Verse 4 tells about the church's response to this barrier and restriction that was placed upon them. Verse 4 says, But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. I love this. 
They're in a moment where the great persecution comes upon them. They're no longer able to do what they've always done. And so they, they flee in all directions. But wherever they went, they took the good news with them. Friends, we might have been given a restriction, but we have a choice to just see it. No, this mission that we're on, it's still going. We've just been redirected. So this season isn't about what we can't do as much as it is about what we are able to do that maybe we have never done before. This isn't a season of restriction or let me say it like this. This season of restriction has led us to discover, hey, we're able to do something we've never done before. In fact, we're doing it right now. As I come to you down the lens of a camera, we are experiencing a new season of the gospel going forward in a way that we have never done before. It's actually, in a, in a, in a gospel going forward sense, so exciting, this moment for the church. This restriction is just a redirection. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. Hundreds of years before Jesus even walks on the earth, this is declared about the church. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills and people from all over the world will, listen, stream there to worship. I wonder if the prophet knew when he was declaring those words that he was actually declaring something about people live streaming to the house of God to worship in numbers like they have never done before. You know, this is the simple way to think about it. Our methods have been restricted. restricted. Our mission has not. Our methods, they've been restricted. The mission of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ's love for all going forward, it has not and never will be restricted. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus declared, hey, I will build my church. Amen. Type that in. I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So friends, let me give you three things as we land this today. Three things. Here's three things that you can do. And they all revolve around contacting someone. You can firstly contact someone and ask them how you can pray for them during this season. During this time, people are going to respond to you in a way that they may not normally. As parents work out how homeschooling works and things along those lines, I tell you what, you calling and saying, hey, what can I pray for you about? That may be the first thing that they say. This is what I want to add to it. We are coming into a season of seeing God's hand move in a miraculous way more than we have in times gone by. So I want to encourage you, contact someone. Say, hey, can I pray for you? Or what can I pray for you about in this season? And believe God for a miracle. Number two, you can contact someone who may need some extra help with the essentials. And we have a wonderful service at Lifehouse called Lifehouse Care, who are still fully functioning and already in many ways have been an incredible blessing to the communities that we're a part of. You can contact them and you can uh, direct someone towards the food pantries, an incredible resource to people in our communities at this time. Please take advantage of that. And if you need more information, it's all on the website. You already know that. And thirdly, you can contact someone through your social media, through whatever platform you choose to contact people, and you can invite them personally to an online service just like this one, a space where they are going to hear directly the good news about who Jesus Christ is, what He has done for us, and what that means for us today. We might be physically restricted to our homes, but the mission God has given the church will never be restricted. Let's be a church that stays committed to the mission no matter what season of life we are in. God bless you, church. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much that when you instigated the mission for the church to take the good news forward to all the nations, 
You did that already knowing that we would encounter seasons like this. And so, Lord, I want to thank you that you're not surprised by this moment. You're not, you're not shocked by this. You're not taken aback by this. In fact, Lord, you have given your church at this time an opportunity to move away from methods that we've thought were the answer and stay focused on the mission, which will always be the answer, to take the good news to everyone everywhere. Jesus, we ask that in our communities right at this time that there would be uh, a great opportunity. Open doors is what is written in the New Testament for us to continue to share your love with people, your grace, your mercy, your kindness and your favour with people. We ask that you would empower us to do that with great courage and boldness like we've never known before. And Lord, we do with a great expectation that there is going to be miracles that follow in ways that are unprecedented, that we have never seen before. And God, you are going to continue to glorify your name in and through our lives as we keep focused on the mission ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church.